Father in heaven, thank you so much for your grace and your providence and everything that comes to us. Help us to realize that in all circumstances, you're trying to work something out in our lives. Um, we pray that you bless our time together this afternoon. May it be helpful, informative, and practical. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for those of you that don't know Craig and I, or what OCI is, just wanted to share briefly, OCI is an international ministry, a family of supporting ministries. Right now, there's about 124 in 44 different countries. And um, our desire is to see, in every country in the world, lay people engaged in ministry. And so that gives us a lot of opportunity to rub shoulders with people. It gives us a lot of opportunity to sit on boards, um, far too many boards. And when you sit on those boards or when you're working closely with people, obviously there's plenty of opportunity to encounter a difficult person. So let me ask, any difficult people that you've encountered in your life, in your work situation or in your ministry? Um, would you be considered a difficult person? <coughs> Maybe. So, um, you know, I think really depending on the circumstance, that's uh, really true, that in certain circumstances, we could be difficult people. And so what we'd like to do this, if, this afternoon is kind of share some principles, share some stories. Uh, the stories that we're going to share are true. The names have been changed to protect the guilty. Um, and just because we share these stories doesn't mean that we're experts in them. My first task as OCI Vice President was to fly from one country across the vast continent to another country to speak to a gentleman who had helped start a ministry. The ministry was running very successfully and confront him about his immorality. And uh, that was my like, first official task as OCI Vice President. You know, up there, oh, I'm coming. Oh, great, come, let's sit down together. How do you have that kind of a conversation with somebody? Um, it's kind of an awkward situation. And, and through that situation, the individual uh, obviously was removed from his position in leadership. And that started a cascading flow of events in that organization in which it ultimately came about where the whole board had to be changed. Everybody resigned off the board. I was put on the board. I hadn't been on the board at that time. Was put on the board, had to choose a whole new board to try to navigate the circumstances. So, interesting situation. Um, Craig's got a couple of stories as well. And as he's going to stand and turn his mic on, I just want to say this. I have some cards for you to get when you leave. They're not particularly on this topic, but they are a list of questions that will help you in a variety of situations. Board meetings, your future, facing change. So, don't let me forget to give these to you at the end of the presentation. So one of the things we get to do on top of sitting on lots of boards is organizations sometimes will get us involved in doing assessments of their organizational health. And so um, not too long ago, um, a, an organization called and asked that we come and, and in, uh, go through with each one of the staff departments and do a survey of a variety of questions in relation to how they were performing their um, following of the board's policies for the organization. And so we sat down and went through each department and went through this process. And as I was doing this, it became very clear that the organization was split down the middle over certain issues. And it was very polarized in relation to people. And the tricky thing was both sides were spearheaded by very gifted and very strong people. What do you do in a situation where you're dealing with two very strong people, very gifted people, and the opportunity to have a divided campus? And I would say opportunity in the negative sense. And so it was an interesting experience um, because I had to decide at that moment, do I try to fix what is not fixable? Or do we start to look at how can both individuals, both factions, begin to look for ways to continue their ministries 
successfully by the grace of God, but in different places. And so looking with, at, uh, at situations with difficult people, sometimes we want to believe that because people are Christians, they should always be able to work it out and work together. But if you think about the story of Paul and the story of John Mark, we see that I actually believe that, that it would have been ideal for both of them to be able to work together with, uh, with each other. But it actually led to a division. And while I don't think the division was God's plan, I do believe that God works in spite of our errors. And he actually helped both of them to spread the gospel more than they would have together. And so I think we have to think about in difficult situations, are they always resolvable? And if they're not resolvable, because people have choice, can we work together with people to help them continue their ministry, but continue it in different places? And so that was an interesting story um, that I experienced. So one board that I sat on had a board chairman that was, uh, what's the right word, extremely stubborn and vocal and demeaning to his board members, called us all a group of idiots at one point in time. And uh, how do you respond to that? Yeah, you know, and maybe some of you are not involved in ministries or have boards, but maybe some of you sit on church boards. Has anybody ever been in a church board that was uncomfortable at times? Uh, where people really kind of dig into their positions. So, you know, meeting difficult people crosses a lot of lines, a lot of circumstances, we could say. Um, and so I want to kind of say this, that this is very important, that conflict really is unavoidable. And if you're in ministry or you're working in your church or you have a business and you realize that there's conflict, get over the fact that you're in conflict. I, mean, I hate to be difficult to you or rude or blunt, but really, conflict is unavoidable. And we need to realize, OK, I am going to run into this. Question is, how am I going to navigate it? And really, um, in organizations, it's important that we have healthy conflict. Craig? So in, in, that, last, in that last experience that I shared, um, it was actually really interesting sitting down with some of the folks that were on the board of that organization and talking about the inevitable that was coming. Um, they recognized that in their organization, they had failed to have healthy, unavoidable conflict in small, contained settings. Because if they had been able to deal with the issue that was actually quite small to start with, before it grew and before there were sides, they would have been able to, quite likely to have worked it out. But because they didn't recognize that conflict was unavoidable, and they thought, well, let's avoid conflict, they actually led to a conflict that was unresolvable at that point. Yeah, so just, you know, kind of quick poll here. How many of you like to avoid conflict? Just raise your hand. All right, so Jesse is the only one that really like, likes conflict. I probably would have said that in the very guy. Uh, um, so most of us really were like, no, I want to avoid this. And so we avoid having these difficult conversations with difficult people. And that really is not a good strategy for a healthy ministry. It's not a good strategy for a healthy family. It's not a good strategy for a healthy church. So we really need to learn, OK, so how can I engage in this circumstance, this situation, in a way that's going to bring uh, positive and, and, and let's, let me give a disclaimer for both Craig and I. We've had a lot of experiences working with difficult people. We are both difficult people as well. Wait, but a, wait we, a minute. Don't be difficult. Um, but just because we've had a lot of experiences doesn't mean we've solved everything. In fact, just before you all came in, we were commiserating with one another about difficult situations that happen today, like an hour before these meetings, different difficult situations for him and for me, and how poorly we handled it. So, um, but let's talk about a couple of difficult people, or kinds of difficult people that are there. So first of all, you have people that are very stubborn and positional. Once they take their, stake out their territory, there is no moving them. You know, they're very entrenched in who they are, what they're thinking. This is the way it's going to be. Oh, with that kind of a person, 
what can we do? Well, we can try to separate the position, the problem, from the person, because usually when we have a conflict, um, so this is unscripted, so Craig, incidentally, is kind of like one of these people, ex the stubborn and positional, <laughs> except he's come to the point where he's willing to move. But in order for him to move, you've really got to go through some conversations with him. Sorry, is this, is this is all true? Um, so, but as we're dealing with things, I've, need to, I've needed to learn, okay, well, we need to separate things. It's very easy when someone's stubborn and positional to attribute to them certain negative intentions, which really aren't there. So on that note, I can think of an instance where we actually worked together and had this happen. So uh, one day, I came into Stephen's office. I'm going to be embarrassed now. Yeah. And, and I sat down, and I think I like just unloaded on him. And he's like, oh, yeah. what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> you know? and, and I was actually quite aggressive about it. I'm not generally... I'm, I'm, I put things forward, but I'm usually not aggressive in nature in doing it's true. it. He's not but I was very one. aggressive about it. He was. And he was thinking, what's with you? you, know, why, am, why, are you why are we having this conversation like this? And I actually had a burden. I wanted to get a certain thing done for the organization that I really felt was important. The trick was... I don't think that I actually communicated it very well, what it was or why I thought it was so important. And so he wasn't sure that it was so important, and I was very frustrated because I didn't think I was being heard. There's something interesting about stubborn and positional people. People who are not always reacting that way can begin to react that way if they don't feel they're heard. Mm -hmm. The good news is he did listen. And I repented of being so stubborn and positional. And we actually came to a good conclusion and got what we needed done. But it was an interesting experience. And I think it was, it was one of the few times where we squared off on an issue fairly strongly <laughs> um, on that, I think. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and just really being open, like, OK, so like, what is this? What? Why is this so important? And then we dialogued. And that was after we knocked one another down and stuff. Um, <laughs> Another kind of difficult person are, are people that are untrustworthy, that you know, perhaps they lie or they're, they're deceitful in some aspects. Simply being open to that person or showing that you're interested in persuasion isn't going to work with that person. But really, we need verification. And we're going to talk about some steps to have conversations to ask for that kind of verification. Another thing to do there when someone that's untrustworthy is to build in consequences rather than just kind of put our heads in the sand to think through certain circumstances. Another kind of difficult people are those that just don't listen. You know, they, they want to talk all the time. And of course, there's a little bit there of personality, uh, which will come into play uh, as we go through the presentation as well. Some people are more talkers, some are more listeners, and those that are more listeners can feel that those are talkers don't listen at all. And so how do we navigate that? How do we come to the point where we really can get the other person's attention and um, uh, communicate what we wanted to say? The last, the last issue here is uh, personal attacks. I don't know if you've ever had this as well. I remember being in a board meeting someplace on some planet. And as I was, we were in that board meeting, it needed to come to a close, and so I was drawing the meeting to the close, and one of the participants in the, the board meeting said, well, I have one more thing I'd like to say. And I was like, well, really, it's time for us to end, and we're going to draw to a close. And they said, well, I really have one more thing to say. Now, the wiser thing for me to have done at that point in time would be to say, okay, what do you have to say? But I didn't. I said, well, we have another meeting starting in five minutes. We really need to close. So we closed. As soon as we closed, this individual erupted with personal attacks against me. And um, then we had our other meeting. And then afterwards, I apologized. And then the personal attacks continued, like really interestingly. And so how do we deal with someone that's attacking us verbally? You know, you. Sometimes spouses do this with one another. I don't know if you've ever noticed. No spouses in this group, I'm sure. But sometimes, you know, you're always like this or you're always like that. Personal attacking. So here's four categories of difficult people. 
that we need to think through. If someone's being stubborn, maybe we need to listen. Maybe I'm really not hearing them. If they're being untrustworthy, maybe I need to put in systems for verification. Uh, if they're not listening, maybe I need to tell them, look, we need to sit down and we need to have a time where we're both conversing one with another. And if they're there for attacking us personally, then perhaps I need to realize, have I done something or is this this person's issue? Um, how can I set ground rules for that kind of a conversation? Yeah, just real quick on, on personal attacks. I think um, it's tricky when you're on boards and you deal with these kind of issues. I can think of a board I was on and I made a comment about a, a policy change and, you know, anybody been on a board and you're like the only one who says something about a specific thing and you're like, you hear crickets and you're thinking, wow, this is not good. Um, it was one of those. Now, you know, I just said, you know, I don't personally, and I shared my opinion about why I didn't think this board uh, policy change was a good idea. And, you know, what I expected was that there might be somebody else who would express a different position. But what I got instead was... Well, if you want an, an attack on myself and on another organization that I sit on and how they perceived that organization worked, therefore my criticism of how the change at this organization wasn't going to be a healthy one. And the question then is, is like, what do you want to do? Well, what was the purpose of that, that dialogue? Was to open it up. But the response, what did the response lead to? It was like a cold blanket. It was like, hey, nobody's going to say anything, even if they think it's wrong. Because what's going to happen? And I think as we're leaders on boards, even if we have strong opinions, it's important that we have an atmosphere where we can be strong, but people can voice opposition because many people have died, many organizations have failed because there's been an atmosphere that's shut down the opportunity for people to dialogue. And that's really important. I underscore that as well, that in... Uh, the ability to have constructive conflict in an organization is really essential. Uh, you know, again, families, ministries, churches, b uh, businesses, um, flying airplanes. I just there are so many examples. Uh, for example, the worst air disaster in history that happened in Tenerife, uh, little island. Um, the disaster took place because the co-pilot was trying to tell the pilot they didn't have clearance for takeoff. They had been forced to land there, fog settled, and the pilot was like, no, we need to take off, we need to take off, we need to get in the air, or we're going to be grounded. And he was so convinced they needed to take off, he started going off the runway, not realizing there was a Pan Am plane in the runway. He hit it, and around 454 people died. It's interesting, the pilot who did that had written a manual on safety for flying. He was KLM's chief in safety. And yet he was in a situation of pressure, and the co-pilot wasn't being heard. And sometimes in our organization, so Craig brings up this idea, this board, somebody pounces on it, and then there's this, oh, I guess I'm not going to say anything. And that's a really unhealthy situation for a family, for a board, for a church, for a business. The one thing I would say about that is we have now an opportunity to respond to a difficult person, right? Because you're going to run into this. I know I run into it. And I believe the right response is to share with the person that we, we need to be able to have open dialogue. And then to share your position, do not let someone being a difficult person stifle a needed comment in relation to something that's important on your board. So let's ask quickly here. Um, any of you have difficult circumstances? Do you want to share? Yeah, your like, hands went up like... <laughs> So, if you don't want to share with them, but you have difficult circumstances. Just generally, want to give us a little hint? Are you going to cover where it's two other people that are having conflict and you're kind of outside trying to... To mediate? Um, pretty much we're going to focus on being in, but the principles that we're going to give will be helpful to that. About this matter of somebody attacking us personally or attacking me personally, how do we separate our emotions from knowing what we should do? In other words, some of the things you talked about, those are things we should do, but we're so hurt and have such negative feelings and we're angry at that person for generating those feelings that 
how do we get our feelings set aside and do what we're supposed to do? Great question. And, and let's come to that in a minute. Let's hold that, but that's an excellent question. Yes. As a parent, I think all of us, when we are parents, we would like to tell something to our kids about our opinion, about some positive things. One of my kids, he doesn't like to listen. He's very smart, but he doesn't like to listen anything that is not, that is in conflict with whatever he wants. It's just about his opinion. Mm -hmm. He's a nice, great kid, but. I don't know what to do. <laughs> okay, so how do we navigate it when there's this, uh, maybe somebody's not listening to us? Yeah, these are all, all real good, yes? How do you handle, if you are on a board where the leader of the board does not like conflict and they perceive anything brought up as a conflict, because, I mean, there's always going to be differences of opinions and people see everything from a different, but if the leader does not like conflict or does not believe in conflict, how, and all they do is, Tamp like, it down. that's, well, yeah, it's like, well, everything is conflict and they don't like conflict and so they just make it where nothing is dealt with. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, something that could happen, something that, that would be good to have, which I recommend, which we recommend for all the ministries at OCI, is to have some kind of board training to raise the awareness of the board members as to what would be good board practice. And uh, so, for example, the OCI board, you won't share this with anybody, but the OCI board in the past had a lot of dysfunction in it and there was a lot of stress in it. And over the past 10 years, the board's really changed, and part of that has been board education, where, no, it is essential for us to be able to communicate strongly, disagree, and respect one another, and because that helps the organization move forward. Yeah. And there's a hand in the back, too. Just go ahead. How... I really like your idea of being able to communicate strongly, but one of the questions is how do you communicate strongly and it not be perceived as you're an angry person? Does we're going to get to that. Sense? Does we're, that make sense? Yeah, sure. We're going to get to you. There was a hand all the way in the back there. Sorry. And then I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I happen to be... Uh, on a committee with someone who's very opinionated and uh, does not like for people to disagree uh, with him. Um, in one meeting we were in, this individual uh, expressed an opinion that I disagreed with, and uh, I said so. Uh, and so the person began to explain uh, his opinion and just kind of his, his behavior escalated. It just became more hostile uh, to the point that it was, uh, it, it appeared to be bullying. Uh, and, and so I, I, I saw that the more the conversation progressed, the worse it became. And so I just stopped uh, talking and, and, and just let it ride so that this person could, you know, calm down some. Uh, when the meeting was over, I did say, I'd like to have a conversation with you, please. I need to talk to you. And so uh, in the conversation, in the private conversation, just between the two of us, I explained uh, that the conversation uh, from uh, his side came across as bullying, intimidation, and that kind of thing. And I just explained, uh, I want to walk in the light with you. And uh, I don't want us to have these kinds of differences because, you know, I want to love you and I want to have a, a, a proper relationship with you. And so I just explained how I felt. And so it really seemed to make a difference because uh, we, we are able to relate to each Good. other to talk now in a better way. Okay, so let's think for a moment here about uh, conflict conversations that might happen with somebody. Somebody at your work uh, reams you out for doing something wrong or, you, or you're disappointed in something. In every conflict conversation, there are three levels 
in the conversation. Okay, there's what happened, how do I feel about what happened, and how does this impact my identity? And so this, this is important for us. So when we're thinking, well, what happened, your perception and my perception of what happened, or your perception and the difficult person's perception of what happened might be very different because we have different truth assumptions. So for example, um, if, if my family is not five minutes early to an event, we're late. That comes from my wife. Um, and so there's a truth assumption there. And what's that truth assumption? You gotta be early to be on time because there's this value there. Well, somebody else may have a truth assumption that's very different. Their truth assumption may be, well, I can show up 10 minutes late to meet with you because we're friends and friends are flexible. So here we have two different truth assumptions. We're, we're, one's late, one's there, but there's different assumptions about what happened. Then, in addition to truth assumptions when we're thinking about what happened, there are intention assumptions. We are assuming what the other person is intending. So if somebody's late, that person is rude. They don't care. They're unprofessional. That's my intention assumption. Um, uh, oftentimes when we focus on what happened, we're trying to assign blame, as we'll, we'll get there in a minute. Then there's, how do I feel about what happened? So the gentleman said, someone says something, and oftentimes I feel hurt or I feel angry, I feel ridiculed. And then the question, how does this impact my identity? What does it say about me? So for example, when I had this other meeting with this gentleman who um, was attacking me personally, there's lots of questions about me. Well, how am I as a leader? How am I, you know, in... Uh, functioning here in this board? Am I really socially, totally socially inept? Because that was one of the critiques, was all you care about is time, you don't care about people, as we were talking, because I wanted to end the meeting, I didn't want to hear the story. And so, you know, the, the thrust came, this is a flaw in you, in me. And so now there's this whole, man, am I really a failure? Am I a poor leader? And so these are questions that we think about. Um, when we are thinking about these three conversations, if we're in a conflict conversation, then we will have these kind of goals. What do I mean? If, if I'm in a conflict, if I'm being antagonistic or feeling antagonism, then when I'm discussing what happened, my motivation is going to be to persuade the other person to see things my way or to try to get them to admit that they were wrong. Now, um, one of my pet peeves is when somebody tells me something that's not completely true. I don't know if that bothers anybody else here. We went to a restaurant and um, we reserved a particular table. It was my office staff. We went to the restaurant, we reserved the table, and the, there were people at the table that we had reserved. And so then the manager said, well, that table is really not very nice. We have this table for you. Well, but that table was round, and we wanted to sit in a circle and talk to people. And the manager, simply, instead of simply saying, hey, I'm really sorry, someone's at the table, I have to move you, he was giving me excuses, which unfortunately hits me the wrong way. And so I was, you know, like steam's coming out of my ears and my dear wife is like, what are you so upset about? And it's like, well, if he would just say he was wrong, it would be okay. Because then I would be right, you know? <laughs> and too often when we're in a conflict situation, something happened and we're talking to the person about what happened when we're in conflict, we want to persuade them that you're wrong or we want them to admit blame. That's not very healthy for us, as we'll see. Come on. Yep. Greg. So, something that I think comes into play in dealing with difficult people is I actually believe there's a disproportional um, 
amount of difficult people in leadership. And I think there's some elements of, of leadership that calls for someone to, to be a little strong. And so um, I think we often run into this and we'll be in a board and, and I think I heard someone say, hey, you know, I approach someone and they just seem like they're constantly defensive or attack back when, when, I, when I'm talking to them. Um, when people are in leadership or when people are up front a lot, there's a certain amount of, I don't know what you want to call it, but I want to say it's adrenaline. There's a certain amount of, of position that is developed and people get used to it. And so when it's questioned, people can begin to believe that their identity depends on how good they are up yeah. front and how much control they have in an organization. And I think um, on one side, we have to recognize that and say, okay, sometimes I might actually need to deal with an issue that I'd like to and should be able to deal with in a board on the outside to begin with, with that person one-on-one, -on -one, because I have to recognize that that person is going to feel their position threatened if I point out something that makes them lose face and look wrong in that in that setting. I think also, um, a, as leaders, we need to be able to work with, um, through our positions and our identity not being connected. Because I, I believe our position is found in Christ. Whether we have a position or whether people see us as an authority or whether they see us up front, we need to be secure in Christ. And so I think as leaders, if we're in those roles, we need to think about that. And when we want to react to someone questioning our position or what feels like taking us out of something that we're used to being in, losing control, that we say, Lord, is that me just being used to position or is there really a problem there? Yep. Right. So again, if we're in a conflict situation, um, there's, again, there's what happened, there's how I feel about what happened, and if I'm in a conflict situation, one or two things are gonna happen. I could be trying to avoid my feelings keep them suppressed, I'm not gonna tell the person what my feelings are, or I'm just gonna let them have it, I'm gonna blast them, and my feelings are gonna come out, you know, like an explosion, and um, probably some of you have had that happen to you, or done it to others. And lastly, if I'm in a conflict situation, I'm dealing with someone difficult, when, as Craig just said, if I'm in leadership and my identity feels threatened, my Default is going to be to protect my image, protect my identity. Um, so again, we have, my wife and I have three children. They're, they're grown, they're young adults. And sometimes we would like them to do certain things a certain way because it reflects on us. And when they don't, then it, what are we going to do? Because how does it impact me as a parent? How, do, how does it impact um, me as a leader, as a pastor, whatever it is? It's my identity. And as Craig brought out, it's important for us to realize where our identities really are grounded. So instead of conflict conversations, we want to have learning conversations. And that's really important. This is a really important aspect. We're dealing with difficult people. We need to begin to have a mindset that moves away from just conflict to learning. Moving away from having absolute knowledge to being curious about someone else's situation. So for example, there's a, there's a board that I happen to be the chairman of in, a, in another world someplace, another continent, another, not another continent really, but just another world. And uh, there are people in the area of this particular organization who are communicating that all I am interested in is killing the ministry and stealing the assets. Well, not stealing them personally. Well, maybe they think that. I'm not sure entirely. But, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a very current situation. And this person is going around and actually they've engaged in legal efforts and their whole focus is, you know, we need to get OCI out of this and we need to get Grabner out of this because all he wants to do is kill this thing. And so when I hear that, well, how would you respond if you heard that? <laughs> so, you know, so when I first heard it, my like reaction is, okay, well, forget it. We're not going to help you anymore. You're on your own, you know, whatever. And it's like, okay, just calm down, take a deep breath. And then I began to think, okay, what is it that this guy thinks that's brought him to that situation? 
try to move from a conflict situation to curiosity, to beginning to wonder, oh, what's going on in his mind? What impact is, what is the impact of his life? What has he heard? You know, what have people told him? Because I've even never really met the person. Um, so when we're in a learning conversation, we want to have different goals. When we're talking with someone about what happened and what happened, somebody said this about you, the board chairman was rude, the pastor was insensitive, your spouse told you you really shouldn't have any more ice cream because you're gaining weight. Um, you know, there are all sorts of things come about. So what happened? When we're in a learning conversation, we're not trying to persuade or assign blame. We want to have mutual understanding. We want to try to approach what happened from the point of view of what can we learn about this together? How can we dialogue about this together? Do you have something? Um, how can we both see what we contributed to bring this about? So, to go back to my example of the individual who's attacking me, okay, I could see that, that I made a contribution to this by cutting the meeting off quickly and uh, hurting this individual's feelings and giving this individual the impression that I really didn't care about that person as an individual, which wasn't true. I highly value the person a lot. Um, but we could have had this conversation in a learning together. What what did we both do to contribute this? Unfortunately, once that happened, I was in the mindset of, you know, you need to apologize. I mean, I apologized. I said, look, I'm really sorry. And then the person just attacked me more. And I was like, you know, you need to apologize. Well, you know, uh, actually, there's something in the book, Mount of Blessings, on that. Sorry, I forgot the page, where it actually talks about when people have wronged us, she says something like, it is their duty, no doubt, to apologize to us. But we should not withhold forgiveness before they've apologized. We should have an attitude of forgiveness to them first. I think there's something related to the gospel about that. You know, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. So again, this is an important mindset. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, what I've seen is areas where I've gotten into conflict and someone maybe has, has you know, attacked you or you've been in, in, in a situation where they've done you wrong and then, you know, we retaliate in a small way and then we have a problem because, like you say, I want it to be resolved by them fixing this great wrong that they have done. The problem is they also recognize the wrong that I've done. And oftentimes I believe we can pave the way to wrongs being righted by making right even minor things that we've done to contribute to a situation that might have led to a conflict. Because if we acknowledge our guilt and then leave it there and we don't try to dig out then some reaction from them, people then come and say, you know what? And then they're free to acknowledge and deal with the issues that they contributed to that conflict. Yeah, it's true. Then again, when we are in a learning conversation, we want to address our feelings without impugning judgment to that person. So we want to be able to tell somebody, you know, this circumstance made me feel this way. I'm sure I did something to make you feel that way, to be open with our feelings, again, without judgment, because we're not trying to assign blame. We're trying to have a learning conversation. And then, of course, the question about our identity this is, of course, vital for us, is that we need to realize that our identity is grounded in Jesus Christ. There's one person on this planet that claims infallibility. Who is that? Jesus no, Jesus isn't here now. Uh, the Pope, you know, claims infallibility at least when he speaks ex cathedra out of the throne from when he's sitting on the, the papal throne. We don't believe in infallibility, is that correct? Right? So then why do we act as though we need to be infallible? As though when we've made a mistake, it threatens our identity. And really, that's an important thing for us. We're not infallible. We are going to make mistakes. 
And so again, it's very important for us. We will make mistakes. We will have conflict. Our identity does not to be threatened. But I would encourage you, with some kind of a difficult situation you're in, is to begin to think through on these levels. Okay, so what happened? How do I feel about what happened? And how does this impact who I am? It's very, it, it's, it's very important. Um, so again, as I said, when we think about what happened, we oftentimes are involved with these truth assumptions, intention assumptions. And this is really, really bad. Let me just say something about intention assumptions as well, or further. Uh, if you're driving someplace, and you're in a hurry, and you cut somebody off, what does that say about you? Okay, you're rude. But how do you feel about what you did? Guilty? Okay. So some of us don't feel guilty when we do that as drivers, but I'm glad that you do. Okay, you know, really? Huh? King of the road. Usually sometimes if we're late for something and we're rude to somebody, we'll say, well, I'm late. And that's my rationale. Now, if somebody does the same thing to us, then what? Well, then, yeah, no, they're not only rude. They're aggressive. They're rude. They're an idiot. You know, Take away their license. You would take away their license. <laughs> we begin to impugn much more to them than when we do it. Um, yeah, you know, we tend to excuse our actions much easier than other people's actions. C.S. Lewis talks about this in one of his books where he discusses the idea, the, the statement where it says that Christ, that we should love the sinner and hate the sin. You've heard that, right? And so C.S. Lewis discusses that. And, and, you know, is it really possible to love the sinner and hate the sin? And as he's writing, he talks about, well, no, what we do is we love the sin, and we end up hating the sinner, except when it's us. When it's us, we're very good at loving the sinner and, uh, you know, not worrying about the sin, you know, hating the sin, perhaps. We make that kind of separation, but for other people, we don't. And so we generally attribute evil to people's motives or actions or their persons when they do something. Um, Here's a quotation from Acts of the Apostles, page 319. I love this. Christ-like love places the most favorable construction on the motives and what? Acts of others. No, I understand. It's an emergency. Uh, Christ-like love places the most favorable assumptions on the acts and motives of others. If we can learn anything about dealing with difficult people, number one, this is what it needs to be. That rather than take that difficult person and say, man, that guy is just, mm, we need to begin to think, okay, what's going on here in this person's life? What is it that's happening here? I also think in this, we also sometimes assign the difficult status to people we don't understand because they have a different personality than us. I can think of an instance when I first began working, I was working in a real estate office, and somebody that I worked with closely uh, was very detail-oriented, had a very opposite personality from, from, from who I am. And I thoroughly made her mad, and she thoroughly made me mad. And I thought, this person is impossible to work with. And she thought, this guy is the most disorganized, you know, doesn't keep his paperwork in order. And, she, you know, and so we had this opposite polar issue. And over time, as I began to learn a little bit about personalities and how to handle personalities, it ended up, by the time we left, that we were best of friends. And we were actually very good workers together because we actually recognized that we needed the strengths of the other mm -hmm. that initially annoyed us. And so I think in, in this, we have, we have to think about personality as it comes through as well. I can think of another instance um, that plays actually a little bit along this line here as well, where I went, went out and I was selling houses. So I was out showing a gentleman houses. And I mean, this guy was hardcore. I mean, he'd look at houses every night. We'd go out, I'd show him houses. And the next day we'd go out and show him houses. And this was like three weeks, like four days a week. 
we were looking at houses. And finally, I'm thinking, this guy, I think he just likes to look at houses for fun. And, and, and one day, I asked him, I said, well, he would always go into the living room and he'd look around and then we would leave. Like, we wouldn't even look at the whole house. I thought, this is strange. And so I finally said, well, what are you looking for? And he goes, well, I've got a 60-inch big screen TV and I have to make sure it'll fix. I'm not going to sell my TV because it was like $12,000 or something when they were really expensive. And so all of a sudden, I realized he wasn't just being difficult. There was actually something else that if I had been curious earlier, we could have avoided many nights out looking at houses. Um, and, and that was a lesson for me to think, hey, sometimes our problems are just a lack of curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I think with motives, you know, my motive, we're starting to begin to think this guy just is a lonely old guy who just wants to look at houses. It actually wasn't the case <laughs> at all. I was assigning to him something that wasn't the case. He had a practical reason, even though I wasn't so big on it, for his decision making. Yeah. Now, again, just a uh, caveat, you know, this is not an excuse to enable abuse of any kind. There are individuals that need to be confronted. But generally, as we're going through life and we're encountering difficult people, we need, okay, how can I put the best construction on their motives first? Then, of course, again, you know, how do I feel about what happened? So, as I said earlier, if I'm not aware of what I'm feeling, or if I'm trying to keep my feelings out of the conversation, I'm really going to fail. So my feelings are going to bleed into this conversation somehow. And, and so it's important for us to be able to tell somebody, um, if the con let me say this, if the conversation is worth the effort, and some of them aren't. Some, you know, somebody, random person says something about you, or somebody's having a bad day, you can just blow it off. But if it's worth being engaged in, how you're feeling about what took place really can be the heart of the conversation. Because what happened, well, that's one thing. How both of us are viewing what happened is entirely different. And we need to, again, think through this. Um, you know, and so a question that I would ask you is when you're dealing with difficult people, where do your feelings hide? You know, where do you try to stuff your feelings, if I could say that? Many years ago, I was working as a chaplain at a, at a hospital, and uh, it was for a class, for a pastoral class. And at the end of every session on the floor, I had to sit with a mentor chaplain and go through it. And that particular day was very trying for me, because it seemed like everybody I was visiting was dying. And one woman in particular had ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is about 94, 95%, or it was anyway, fatal at that time. She had a 10-year-old boy. He was about to lose her mother. My dad died when I was 10. And so, you know, there are all these emotions coming in here. And uh, as I was talking to the, to the senior chaplain, I went into the, his office, and I had my Bible, like, in my back pocket, you know, pocket Bible. And as I sat down, I was like really having this hard time getting it out of my back pocket. It was kind of stuck in there. And as we were talking about this, we were talking about this family, and I was talking about the woman and the boy. And, and then the chaplain said to me, well, what about your feelings? And I was like, what do you mean, what about my feelings? And he was like, well, it seems like your feelings are stuck, just like your Bible's stuck in your back pocket and you can't get it out. And it just was like, yeah, okay, I've got feelings about this as well relating back, obviously, to my, my father's death. And so a question, you know, where do your feelings hide in difficult conversations? How do you relate to them? Ministry of Healing, page 485. Again, another wonderful thought. We should not allow our feelings to be easily wounded. We are to live not to guard our feelings or our reputation, but to save souls. This does not mean your feelings will not be hurt, okay? But we need to realize that when they're being hurt, something's happening in this conversation. Uh, somebody's being aggressive, they're being difficult, they're, being, um, they're not listening. Your feelings are there, but we need to realize, okay, my feelings are not paramount. Winning souls is. And so how can I have a conversation with somebody? How can I have a learning conversation with somebody in which I communicate my feelings to them and I also ask what their feelings are. Like, what made you feel this way that you said this? And if I had been wiser at the time when this particular individual was attacking me personally, I could have asked the question to them. Well, how did I make you feel when I closed the meeting? And find out 
what was the trigger in them that caused them to attack me? Fortunately, I didn't. I just went into my defensive posture mode. And so again, uh, how does this impact my identity? When we're in conflict, again, there's all these questions about who we are. What does this say about me personally? There's questions about our competency here. So a good question for you, is anybody here super competent? Or do you feel like you need to be super competent? Competent. You know, you can do everything. You're a wonderful mother, and you've got everything organized. And hmm. Yeah, okay, Rita, at least I got one super competent person. I really think that probably most of you feel that your competence level is above average. Maybe I should ask that question. How many of you are above average competency? That's a little less threatening. And some of you raised your hands there. If we think we're like this really competent person and then we get negative feedback, what does it do? I was like, oh. I mean, if myself, my sense of who I am is connected to my competency, it's like, oh. So just the other day, my wife and I were having a conversation. Um, one of the things I do in my spare time is I pastor a church in Tennessee. And, um, and so... I don't have that much spare time, so I don't do that well at it. And so my wife was, was reminding me of the list of people that need to be visited. And she's reminding me of this, how many times, sweetie? Uh, <laughs> she's reminding me of this a lot. And every time she does, <clears throat> there's a feeling in my stomach. Now, she's not being difficult. She's being concerned about the visitation, which is a totally appropriate thing. But we were talking about this presentation, we were talking about this whole thing, and I said, you know, when you ask me that question, what about the visitation? My stomach feels tight because my identity as a pastor is being touched. I'm not doing a good job as a pastor because I'm not visiting all these people, okay? I realize I don't have the time to do that, or I should realize that, but we need some system in place there. So again, for you, you know, when your feelings are, are being touched, you need to think through again, how is this impacting me? As a parent with my child, a co-worker in, in organizations, um, you know, sometimes we go from these extremes, I'm super competent to I'm the world's biggest failure. Anybody like go back and forth between those two? And you know, we're, well, we're not. We're not super competent and we're not the world's biggest failure. We begin to think, you know, am I really a good person? Am I worthy of being loved? Well, really, the gospel should answer all those questions for us in that we are very needy individuals, but God has loved us from the foundation of the world, even before we came into this world. Isn't that amazing? Ephesians chapter 1, that God has chosen us in Christ from the foundation of the world. And even before we've done anything, good or bad, God knows all about us, and he says, no, no, I've chosen you. So our identity there needs to be really firm. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us, you are complete in him. So this is really essential for us to be able to enter into different aspects of conversations, to move from certainty to curiosity. What do I mean by that? Something happens. We are certain we know what happened. Well, do we really know what happened? We know our view of what happened. The person was late. The person was rude. The person yelled at me. The person is stubborn or positional. The person didn't listen. I think of an example of this. It wasn't too long ago. I was sitting uh, with, a, with a, some folks, and they were talking about some different stories about things they had done, and they began to share with me about this organization and this thing that had happened at this organization, and they were adamant about how terrible it was. The thing they didn't realize is that I was there when this happened. I was on the board when these certain things happened, and I actually knew what had happened. And it was really fascinating because the story that they painted, I thought, man, I'd be upset too, you know? Be, but their perspective was an honest perspective, it was a perspective that was secondhand, but the difference between that and the reality were, were night and day. And um, I think that's an interesting thing. They could, if they had demonstrated a little more curiosity, they probably could have come up to a situation um, in, a, in a more constructive way. So I think for all of us, it's easy to hear something and then become adamant as if it was fact we knew firsthand, 
and it can put us in the difficult person category sometimes. Yes, and, and you've all had it. Something happens, somebody tells you what a church member did or something else, and then we react. And before reacting, we need to become curious. Oh, I really, I really wonder what happened there. Um, rather than going to blaming, trying to learn. What information does this person have? You know, rather than why are they so irrational? Why are they so rude? Why are they so careless or, or callous? What's their perspective? What's going on with them? An interesting thing that happened is uh, anybody who sits on a board with me knows that I have a, a very um, much less than a poker face. And so it's difficult for me um, when... So just interruption here. He is not the only one that has less than a poker face. There's been plenty of times where I wanted to have a paper bag over my head in board meetings so people couldn't see what was going on. So, you know, if we sit across the, t the table, it can be an interesting experience for both of us. But, um, and so we try to, you know, help it, but it sometimes doesn't work. Well, one time we were on a conference call, and I also have this problem that I'll, somebody will bring something up and I don't agree with it, and I want to respond. You know, I don't want to wait for somebody else to talk. I'm going to get the next word in about it because they're definitely wrong. And so, um, you know, that happens, unfortunately, f sometimes frequently. And so... Excuse we were on me? A <laughs> that happens with great frequency. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we're on this conference call, and I didn't do that. So we got off the conference call, and Stephen goes, you were awfully quiet. And I said, yeah, my headset wasn't working. I couldn't get it to turn on so I could talk. <laughs> and it was actually great. The board went well, and they came to a conclusion, and it was wonderful. <laughs> and so we have now developed this thing. We'll say, well, maybe you know, unplug the headset. And it's a good mechanism in a way that's kind of insider for us to remind each other that, you know, maybe I need to back out a little bit and, and let the thing work out. And I think in, in curiosity situations sometimes, you know, delaying our response allows us time to really know what's going on and to let emotion be controlled by reason. And I need that. Yeah. So to get a different perspective, to kind of get into this curiosity mindset, it's very difficult, it's clearly difficult, when we're in the middle of something. As I said earlier, both Craig and I, just before the session, had two different difficult circumstances that we were in. Um, so we're all learning this, but as we're trying to move to these kind of learning conversations and dealing with difficult people, we want a different perspective. And sometimes it's helpful to get what we could call the third story, or the third point of view. And that would be to ask, what would it look like if an outsider were describing what was going on between you and the difficult person, or two of you? You know, how would an outsider describe it? And if you could go to a person, the person you're having a difficult time with, and come to them and say, well, you know, I'd like to have this conversation. Let's see what we can agree about with what took place and how we feel about it and how it impacts us. And then try to simply without impugning motives to people or trying to persuade or trying to give blame, simply talk about it from this third side of the story, this third perspective. How would an observer describe what was happening? Simply, you know, if, um, if you could just look at it that way. It's a really important thing to begin to work with somebody that's being difficult. We see this, I think, a fair amount through what I would call projection. Uh, you see it in relationships with spouses. You see it in relationships with people. If you have a long history, you sit on a board for a long time, you can react to something that happens that's actually fairly reasonable in an unreasonable way because you have a history of other things that have happened, yeah. and this is just one more of those things, even when it's not. And I think it's important for us to ask the Lord to give us wisdom to not project, and that's where that looking from the third person, would the third person have any context? Well, the answer is no. Now, sometimes we need context, but we need to weigh it out and make sure we're not just reacting and putting someone in a box and saying they can't grow, they can't be different. This is just one more of those things. Yeah, I really want to underscore that. Oftentimes in conflict, the conflict arises because we have other emotional connections. You know, um, it's the way my spouse looks at me, or it's the way I look at my children, or it's the way that person always asks those questions. And so, you know, immediately something happens, and then there's this response, which usually is larger than what the issue is, because we have all this 
background in the conflict. You know, again, if we were going to kind of diagram conflict, you know, there's the issue of whatever it is. Then there's all this ancillary stuff that comes out of it. It's, you know, what did I eat for supper? What did I eat for lunch? How am I feeling? Am I tired? You know, who's on the other side of the story? Is the room too hot? Is it too crowded? Uh, is it too cold? There's all these other issues in conflict. Has the meeting been going on too long? And, and to begin to peel that away to try to get to the core is really helpful. So if you have a difficult person and you want to have a learning conversation, you don't want to be squawking at them like the two penguins are here, uh, you, you, you really want to have this dialogue with them, you first need to realize, okay, this is really worth my time and effort. Not all conversations are. Sometimes you just need to let it slide. Other times, most times, it is worth it. And then to approach the person and, and try to say, well, let's have this kind of a, let's describe this from the third view. Don't begin from your viewpoint. Don't begin from their viewpoint. Come from the third view. Now, uh, and then try to work through, again, what happened? How do I feel? And how does it impact me? I can guarantee you that if you try this, not every conversation will go smoothly. Okay? I guarantee that not every conversation will go smoothly. Because as you enter into it, the other person is going to be presenting their point of view. And so sometimes you have to say, well, yes, I hear you. Let's consider it this way. And keep moving, being persistent with the person to try to get them to really see you're not blaming, you're not trying to persuade, you're trying to work together to find a solution. Now, there are, uh, we could say, exceptions to this that aren't really. First exception to this, which really isn't, is when you're right. Okay? You know what happened, and you know they're wrong. And when you have that mindset, it's going to be very difficult to have a learning conversation. And you think, yeah, but there's, no, there's nothing to discuss here. They're wrong. They need to apologize. They have to learn, right? Let me recommend to you that even when you're right, that's not what the conversation is about. Conversation here isn't about who's right and wrong. The conversation is about how can, I, how can we find a common solution? How can we work together? How can I draw closer to you? How can I have a more Christ-like influence in your life? Now, it may come out, or you may go away thinking uh, that you're right. But there, again, there needs to be perspective so that the two of you can come together to a good solution. I like to compare it to, do I want to win, or do I want God's plan to win? Because we get into scenarios, whether it's on a board, whether it's, it's in a conflict, and human nature becomes competitive and says, no, you know, I'm going to be right. I want to have the last say. I want to. And we end up in this situation, and, and then we lose the objectivity that what if I was wrong? Do I want God's plan, or do I just want to win? Um, I kind of compare it to, do I want to have character, or do I want conquest? And I think we have to think about that in our, in our situations that we deal with. Yeah. So, sorry. Excellent. To ask that question, why are you feeling this way? What's the circumstance behind it? Again, coming from a learning perspective. So one exception is when I'm right, but it's not really exception. The other exception, sometimes we think, is when I have to give bad news. When I need to fire somebody, I need to let somebody go, which that happens in organizations. Um, you can still have a learning conversation. You can still approach it with curiosity and be firm. So if there's a person that's untrustworthy, for example, or stubborn and positional, and they won't move, and, and you come to the place that this person needs to leave the organization, uh, you need to have that conversation, but it can still be a learning conversation. You can still ask what their perspective is, hear their viewpoint, and then say, well, I hear you, yet this needs to take place. Uh, this needs to follow as well. So let's shift as we kind of draw to a close here. Uh, so how not to be difficult people? This is probably important as well. And so how not to be a difficult person? First thing here is to begin to ask ourselves, what is my contribution to this circumstance? What's my contribution to this problem? Have I miscommunicated? 
Am I unapproachable? Do I avoid conflict? What's my contribution to this? As Craig alluded to earlier, we need to think through, you know, what are the personalities involved? And there's an instrument that we've used at OCI with some of our member ministries. Um, it's, it's a workplace personality profile where everybody fills them out, and then we look at how the team fits together as well, where we could see how some people like conflict, how other people don't. Some people are visionary. Other people are very practical. Some people are very organized. Some people are very disorganized. Not that he's organized. Um, some people are, you know, in that whole situation and just realize, okay, these are personality issues, and they're not necessarily character flaws. As Craig mentioned earlier, sometimes we need to learn to mute the headset and just not say something, okay? We just need to like, okay, I need to not speak. What did you say? Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Is that what you're saying? That's another thing my wife tells me all the time. SSS, dear. Uh, swift, slow to hear, slow to speak. Yes, that's true too. Um, something else here, I hope this isn't offensive to anybody, is using your poker chips. What do I mean by this? Just an illustration for us. If you're in a, in a board meeting, for example, certain circumstance, it's important for us to realize that certain of us, with our personalities and our expressions, can be domineering in a board. Perhaps you've encountered that, where one or two people just want to control the circumstance. Well, it's helpful to kind of communicate to the board and say, look, in the way we're going to operate, everybody has an imaginary stack of poker chips. And every time you speak, you're putting one in. And when you're out of poker chips, you're done talking. And so, you know, to help us think through, look, everybody's time is valuable. I don't want to monopolize, monopolize this conversation. I want to be sensitive to the way other people feel. And um, lastly, this is another in-house expression. It's called peeling an orange. Um, I have a hard time peeling oranges. I'll be very blunt with you. Because, you know, you start peeling them, and then your finger gets in the navel part, and then the juice comes down. So I get, I used to get frustrated at peeling oranges, and I would just cut them. So we were traveling, my family and I, we were in Israel, and my son saw this, and he goes, Dad, what is your problem? This is how you peel an orange. Be patient. And he starts peeling the orange, and then he gave me like 10 oranges. And he says, now, I want you to peel every one of these oranges. And so, you know, there's this whole thing about peeling an orange slowly so I don't get too frustrated with it. And so now it's kind of this in-house conversation. When one of us is getting intense, the other one simply says, it's time to peel an orange. And we just, you know, pause and think through. So you should think of some in-house things for yourself that perhaps your spouse could say or your friends could say or your coworkers could say to you as well. Okay, um, Craig? Yeah, just one last thing we haven't gotten to get into as much is, is workplace conflict and dealing with positions. We talked a little bit about it in board settings, um, but it's very important not to avoid workplace conflict if you're in a leadership position. We've seen some uh, instances where organizations have had the feeling that something's not going to work out. Anybody been in a workplace and you, you had a work a coworker or you had a, a, an employee or someone working and you're like, you know, in your heart, in your stomach, this isn't going to turn out well, but you don't want to deal with it. Anybody been in that situation at all? Yeah, see, lots of us have. And the temptation is to extend the time period and either put it off, hope it will go away, or hope that um, it'll manifest itself a little more so it's easier to deal with. Uh, recently, an organization was dealing with a situation like this. They had someone who was in a leadership position of a department, in a strong personality, and they went through the process saying, hey, we're going to have to, we're clearly going to have to let this person go, but we we're just don't want to deal with it yet. We want to let it manifest itself a little bit more. And they went through that process. Well, they also had in that department some really good workers. They also had somebody they thought, this is a good person to replace the person who is um, probably going to have to leave. But by taking too much time, by procrastinating, the good people on the team said, we can't take this anymore, and they left. The person who was going to actually replace the person, they left. And at the very end, the person who they wanted to leave left. The problem was is they had nobody left at all. And I think that's really important for us not to avoid conflict so much that we're not willing to deal with an issue. Because if you let problems 
stay in their, in their current position, they grow, and they actually can lead to systemic damage to the organizations. Yeah, that's really true. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Our time's up. Um, let's bow our heads together for a word of prayer as we close. Father in heaven, thank you for your grace. Please help us, teach us, each one. Again, may our identity be firmly rooted in Jesus Christ, that we could enter into conversations with others from a learning perspective. Give us wisdom and guidance. Teach us, Lord, to draw close uh, to those that most need our love. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.